Today, I'm speaking with Dr. Robert Kelly, an expert in prehistoric North American archaeology who literally wrote the book on hunter-gatherers. We're focusing today on his book, The Fifth Beginning, what six million years of human history can tell us about our future. I'm Sebastian Weatherby, and this is The Tell. Yeah, hi, Bob. Thanks for joining me. Hi, happy to be here. Today, I was going to ask you a lot about the book that you wrote uh, in 2016 yeah. for public audience, The Fifth Beginning. And before we got into that and, and some of the really big sweeping topics that it deals with, I wanted to start, if you could, would you be willing to give people kind of the dinner party explanation of what kind of an archaeologist you are, what your interests are within the field? Oh, well, my, my primary interest is in the archaeology of hunting and gathering peoples, mm -hmm. primarily Western North, North America. I've done research on the initial uh, colonization of, of the Western Hemisphere, mm -hmm. um, not, not the European colonization, but the colonization. Yeah, the original by, colonization. By the, 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 the original yeah. <laughs> one by, by the indigenous folks. I've, I've also done some work on European and African archaeology, looking at um, the appearance of what would most broadly be called art objects, things mm -hmm. that are um, somehow communicating, symbolically communicating something about about the world as people understood it mm -hmm. back back then. But my my interests are overridingly with hunting and gathering peoples, uh, both from ethnographic and uh, archaeological data. What drew you to hunter-gatherers? Uh, uh, that's an interesting question. I suppose that um, it, it goes way back to when I was very, very young, because I've always been interested in hunting and gathering peoples. And I suppose um, the reason is that I had the same sort of, of romantic notions that many people have mm -hmm. about hunter-gatherers, that they were people. Some, there's an idyllic element to it. There's a there's an there, there, there's an idealist yeah. uh, element yeah. to it that these were people who lived simply um, and who lived off of the land, and I find mm -hmm. those ideas very attractive. Yeah, um, uh, who didn't have a lot of material possessions who didn't have uh, social hierarchies. Yeah. And um, I, I think that's what drew me to, to them. Yeah. And, um, you know, I've lost a lot of those <laughs> ideas over the, over the years. Had as some a, illusions dispelled. I, I've had a number <laughs> of illusions dispelled. Um, but that's still what, it's still what uh, in, interests me. Mm -hmm. um, because... You can still study basically anything you'd want to study about people. You can study it through hunting and gathering mm -hmm. uh, folks. I'm curious what, what your response would be to this. W one of the reasons that when I got to grad school, I chose to go with studying hunter-gatherers and especially the Paleolithic is most periods of history strike me as a vignette. Um, in the sense that, say, if I were to understand some political event that took place in a Roman city in 200 AD, that's a very particular moment. And it's really hard to know much about myself, for instance, from that particular moment. But everywhere had a Paleolithic, and that lasted much longer than any, any particular cultural uh, pattern that's taken place since then. The, it seems to me like they don't uh, they don't allow us to look at all of us on a grand scale in terms of human nature in the, quite the same way. Uh, it's, it's, you're, you're right. that we, we all started as hunter-gatherers. If we go back far enough, we're, we're all in Africa, and we're all hunting and gathering. All of our ancestors were hunter-gatherers. The entire world was populated by hunting and gathering peoples, mm -hmm. um, it, pretty pretty much almost the I should say almost the entire world, because parts of um, uh, Polynesia and Micronesia, uh, New Zealand, yeah, um, Madagascar, these are all colonized by horticultural uh, mm -hmm. peoples. Um, but 
the vast majority of the world was populated by hunting and gathering peoples out of Africa, into Europe, across Asia, across the Bering Straits, into the Western Hemisphere, all the way down to Tierra del Fuego. Yeah. The, um, the wor- all the, the world's populations all start as hunting and gathering peoples. And for, for, for some, that's, that's led many people to think that we, we, were, we were constructed as a species. We became who we are as a species while we were hunter hunter gatherers. Mm-hmm. So a lot of people might look to hunter gatherers to get um, to get an understanding of what real human nature is is like. And I'm putting air quotes yeah, around the word yeah. real, right? Yeah. Um, and I'm not I'm not so sure how how much I really accept of that. Uh-huh. But it's certainly true that if anyone in the on the planet wants to trace their history back far enough, it will take them back to ancestors who are hunting and gathering peoples. So let me ask you a question about w- why you wrote The Fifth Beginning, uh, because in academia, people are constantly pushed to specialize and run down the deepest rabbit holes that they can go. Yep. And there's a publisher die cycle, which doesn't care at all about books written for the public. Correct. That, so you wasted your time. <laughs> um, <laughs> you're not supposed to. You're not supposed to write that kind of book. Um, well, I, actually, I think um, it's 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 actually precisely the kind of book that we should write. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But most of us should not be writing it until we've reached a certain stage in our in our career. Mm-hmm. Now, one, I, I was you know a tenured full professor by the time I wrote that that book. Mm-hmm. So um, it, it, it doesn't count against me. Yeah. Um, and frankly, I didn't need any more public publications, right? And there were, yeah, I, couldn't, sure. <laughs> I couldn't go any higher in the, yeah. in the, in the academic hi- hierarchy. So that was the right time to take on that kind of, of, yeah. of project. But also, we ultimately have to give back. Mm-hmm. All of archaeology is supported by the public. It's tuition dollars. It's tax dollars. Mm-hmm. It's, we're all supported by the by the public. At some point, we have to give back something other than the highly technical papers that are going to be read by a very small number of our peers. So um, I wrote the the fifth beginning in in part to sort of live up to that. Um, that um, uh, responsibility to give back to the to the public in a language that was intelligible to yeah. most people. Um, yeah, it's an easy read. It's it's not a it, it is not a, a giant book. It, it is a re- easy read. Yeah. I, I wrote it so that my mother could understand. It. <laughs> That's who I had in mind when I when I wrote it. Would mom be able to understand this? But I do think it's it's an obligation. Yeah, and all archaeologists will tell you that the reason we study the past is to understand the future. Mm-hmm. That's the language that everybody uses. And, but very, very few of us actually do it. Yeah. Um, so I thought about that book for a long while. It was published in 2016, but I actually gave my first lecture on it probably in the 1980s. It, it, I, I wasn't ready so, to yeah, write so the book. But it's been percolating for kind it, of a long time. It's been percolating for a long time. Yeah. Um, and I gave the actual first lecture that would become the book probably in 2007, but it still had to work through my brain um, and and find a way to talk about it in, yeah, an accessible language that people could read. When you talk about the fifth beginning, you, you also imply there have been four other beginnings before that. What do you mean by beginning in the first place? Well, um, I, 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 I use the word beginning, and I, I, should, I should point out that the, the original, one of the original titles of the book, we went through several mm-hmm. titles. The, 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 the publisher really cares about the title because they know that the title is what Good helps title, to, a good flashy title. cover. Yep, yeah. that's what sells the book. Yeah. Um, so 
we went we went through a couple, and I was working with the fifth transition, and mm-hmm. I, I didn't. That's just boring. Let's mm-hmm. let's be honest. Um, and I actually gave the book to one of my former graduate students. Um, her name was Rachel Reckon. She was in the doctoral program at Cambridge University at the time. I sent her the manuscript just to get a, a, an outside reader. And, and I said, oh, by the way, I need, I need a new title f- for this book. And she's the one who said, well, you're talking about beginnings here, about starting new, the, yeah. the, the humanity kind yeah. of starting over again in a very different way. So she said that the, those are beginnings. Why not the fifth beginning? And I said, perfect. This is why I gave <laughs> yeah. you the book to read. Yeah, it was, it was a good a good title. Yeah. And it really fit what I wanted to what I wanted to say in the book which which was that humanity really um you can look at it as having started over again uh operating in a completely different way. So the origins of te- technology is the yeah. first beginning and that that changes the way our ancestors sort of dealt with their environment. mm mm-hmm. Mhm. And it never stopped. I, I mean, technology is an essential part of the human adaptation mm-hmm. today. Um, the second was the the, the origins of of, uh, of of culture and the the ability to use symbols and art and the notions of afterlife, and and that's really critical to our species today. We are all cultural, and uh, we could. This is a debatable topic, but in, in my opinion, given my definition of culture, we're the only critters on the planet that are that are cultural. Mm-hmm. There's mm-hmm. other animals who can learn things and are, acquire knowledge that's passed down socially, but no one is cultural in the way that humans are cultural. So that that was essential, and that that changed who we were. Yeah, we now operated not only in terms of the natural environment. But we operated in terms of this vision of what what life was was supposed to be like. The third is the origins of uh, agriculture. This this really revolutionized the way that we get food, and it took a long time for that adaptation to reach all parts of the globe. But yeah. it has eventually yeah. reached basically all parts of the globe, even in places where people can't grow food. Like in the Arctic, they're still heavily reliant on that agriculture. Yeah, they're still economy. eating imported foods. They're from eating the imported supply foods, chain and right? That have been farmed somewhere. Um, that had an effect on human po- population. Yeah, um, and it had an effect on the kind of technology that that we use. It had it, it removed many people from food production. Yeah, um, it it changed everything, and then. Uh, following very closely behind that is the origins of of the state, uh, which again happened only in a few places, and it took a while for that form of organization to spread across the globe. But indeed, as we sit here today, every single person in the world lives in a state society. Do you think if we could see with more clarity in far enough back in time, say a couple million years to you know, old one tools or, or uh, to some of 50 to 70,000 years ago, do you think we would see the same kind of initial emergence and a ripple outward from there of, of the first few beginnings? Uh, um, almost, almost certainly, um, because those, some of those transitions, um, origins of technology, probably is is some idea that some hominin had mm-hmm. um, and others who weren't quite capable of understanding the the world in the way that that hominin um, was able to mm-hmm. they nonetheless could mimic that yeah. that ho- hominin and and picked up what that person was was doing so I would I would expect it to kind of spread out from, from yeah. centers, we we can't really see that, of course, because we can't 
control our our time well enough. We can't control age estimates. Mm-hmm. We we can at that vast reach of time when we're talking yeah. Oldowan technology two yeah. and a half million years ago or so. Uh, we can't. Everything is dated to plus or minus a couple of hundred thousand years. So yeah. so you can't you can't see it. Same thing probably happened with the origins of 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 culture. Mm-hmm. That almost certainly requires some kind of genetic shift which changes the neurology of the of the human mind. We don't know exactly what that is. One idea is that we have these different modules in our mind yeah, for this is Mithin's. Steve, Stephen Mithin's yeah. idea, which I thought it, it, it certainly makes a lot of sense. I don't yeah. know if it's correct, yeah. but being able to think in terms of technology, social organization, language, and what's the fourth one? Um, I forget it. I think uh, culture is separate, right? Well, culture mm-hmm. is the breaking down of the barriers right, between Right, the interconnectivity those. between each of the modules. So we could connect yeah. those, those modules together. So we could start talking about someone, really, it's the ability to use met- metaphors. Mm-hmm. So I can talk about somebody as being as clever as a fox Yeah. when yeah. if somebody can't understand metaphors, is not able to break down the boundaries between who they – they they know this person as a as a person, and they know what a fox is. But connecting those two together is is that one that's not possible if your brain can't make those those connections across those modules. There, there's a joke about that. And have you seen Guardians of the Galaxy? Yes. <laughs> you know Drax the Destroyer's. Um, uh, nothing goes over my head. My reflexes are too quick. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> there's. There's a quote in the book that I think kind of speaks to two really often different and unfortunately sometimes opposed ways of thinking about archaeology or of applying archaeology that are definitely relevant to a book like this, which is dealing with really huge patterns and, you know, across really big swaths of time, um, which is, uh, and this will be paraphrased slightly, but you, you say that, uh, that archaeology is not always the best at seeing the trees, but it's very good at seeing the forest. What, what do you mean by that? Well, what, what, what I mean by that is um, it's, it's actually very difficult for archaeology to give us an, an almost ethnographic snapshot of what the past was like. Mm-hmm. So, and, and many archaeologists have a, a, approached the excavation and the reporting and the interpretation of an archaeological site so that you, the reader, would have an almost ethnographic-like sense of being there mm-hmm. in, the, in the past so that they can give you an image of what you would have seen if you had walked into this camp 10,000 years ago. Yeah. Here's You would have seen four houses, and you would have seen Someone sitting over here flint napping a, a spear point, and someone over here would be tanning a, a hide, mm-hmm. and someone over here is going to be cooking around the fire, and there were X number of people here, and and um, they're sharing meat between these this house and this house, but not between this house and so that this house. So this is the this is the personal and kind of humanistic it, it's side. A, it's very personal. It's very hum, humanistic. Yeah. The the ultimate example of it, because archaeology occasionally can can do this. Are you going to say Pompeii? No, not Pompeii, but uh, um, uh, Utsi. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, Utsi was somebody who died about, a man who died about 5,000 years ago, very high in the Alps, uh, in the Italian Alps. He was, he was murdered. Mm-hmm. Someone shot him with an arrow in the back. Um, and and he, he was his body was preserved because he was frozen up high. So it's, it's over ten thousand feet in the Alps. And he just it just so happens that after he died, his body gets covered in snow and and by ice, and he's kept in a deep freeze for the next five thousand years. He eventually melts out. He's found in the early nineties by some hikers who thought yeah. it was somebody who had died the year before. I mean, it was so well preserved. That's kind of crazy. It, I, I, I've been to the museum 
um, in um, in Italy, Bolzano, uh, Italy, where they they built this little museum just for Utzi. Yeah. And what we know about this person is unbelievable. We can reconstruct his last 24 hours um, in amazing detail. So much detail that if we could get in a time machine and go back, I'm certain that we could <laughs> convict his killer. We, we could figure out who, who killed him. Yeah. We know what his last meal was. Yeah. We know where he, he grew up. Um, we know where he spent his, the last 10 years of his life. It was not where he was born and raised. Um, we know what path he took in order to get to where he was, he was killed. We knew that he had been in a fight recently. Uh, and as I said, we knew that we know that he was murdered. Yeah. We, we, we know he had been ill several times in the, in recent, recent months. Um, we can tell all kinds of things about him genetically, right? Yeah. Certain th- we can reconstruct his appearance, and in fact, at the museum, they did exactly that. Um, you can stand next to him and have your picture taken. With him. <laughs> uh, it's it's a, it was it's this um, remarkable detail we can get out of this one person, and this really the last twenty four hours of their of their life we know in amazing detail. That's extraordinarily rare. We can't. We can rarely do that kind of detailed reconstruction. The, the, the public, of course, is very excited about this mm-hmm. because it gives you this very intense connection yeah. to this one person. It's, it's a very humanistic mm-hmm. connection, and it, it's, it's wonderful. It's great to do. But, but that's most, not all archaeology. That's, that's, <laughs> it's in not fact, most archaeology. It's not most archaeology. I mean, that's like... A tiny fraction of one percent. Yeah, yeah. Of archaeology, most of the time, we're lucky if we can date something to within about a hundred year span. Mm-hmm. Um, I can tell you this: this site dates to this maybe hundred year span, and usually it's longer yeah. than that. And the farther you go back in time, the the less precise. We, we become. Right. And the wider the windows for, chronologically speaking, for how artifacts are actually related to one another. So like if you have the footprint of a house, you're not dealing always with a Pompeii where uh, it, it represents a fairly short window of human life, but that it it, it could potentially have represent a hundred years of, of people living there. Or, 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 or more. more. Yeah. Or, or more. It's a it's a palimpsest is the word we yeah. often use, um, which was uh, the kind of sheepskins that were used for writing in like Rome and uh, Greece. Yeah, and um, you would write something on it, and then because those those that that kind of vellum paper was yeah. hard to get, someone would come along and kind of erase, scrape it clean, scrape it clean, and yeah. then write over it. Yeah, and you always you'd leave a little bit of the ink behind. Yeah, you do this four or five times, and you've got this. Writing on top of writing on top of writing. Yeah, that's what our most archaeological sites are like. That there. Yeah, we can't date things very, very um, precisely. Not with the kind of precision um, that much of the public, I'm sure, would like to be able to see. He- heck, that many archaeologists would like. I mean, to yeah, be that'd able be great. Why not? But <laughs> yes. <laughs> and so, so and, and you so, end up in a situation where, where in many cases. You're not going to be able to see the exception. You're just going to see the rule. You see general patterns. Yeah, is is what you can see. So, you can see the forest, but not every individual tree. Yeah, uh, that's quite frustrating to many to many people. But um, some years ago, I figured this this is the strength of archaeology. If we can we can ask it to try and always give us utsi, always give us very, very fine grain images of what the past was like. We will be, our, our actual data record would be extremely limited. Yeah. It would be so limited that you really couldn't say anything. Yeah. So Utsi gives us this, this very, very fine grain image of life 5,000 years ago. But um, the rest of the Neo- Neolithic is, is left in this kind of 
kind of think of it as a photo where Utzi is in in clear focus, but the rest of the photo is kind of pixelated. Yeah. But it's sort of like impressionist painting. If you step back far enough from it, yeah, the image that's a appears. great analogy. The image appears. I love that. Um, so uh, that's that's what we can do with archaeology virtually everywhere in the world. So that's its strength. That's what it brings to the table mm-hmm. is its ability yeah. to look at broad patterns in space and time. That's what we can do well. So we, sh- we should use archaeology's strength instead of, quite frankly, crying for the moon <laughs> and, and waiting for that once-in-a-generation experience to, to yeah. come, come along. Yeah. We can learn a great deal from Utzi, but actually he can't tell us very much about the, the whole ne- Neolithic in, in central, central Europe. And we can't expect to find another thousand Utsis just out there waiting for us. You won't find another thousand Utsis. Yeah. Even in a thousand years, you won't find another thousand yeah. Utsis. Yeah. Another theme in the fifth beginning, when you talk about each of these transitions, um, and I guess maybe let's, let's look at the first few to start with, um, from, from the emergence of technology, of tool making to uh, the agricultural revolution, there's, there's this point you make that these aren't planned transitions. Correct. These aren't willed transitions. These are moments that humans hit. It's like a point of no return. Would that be a fair way to put it? Um, at, a, at a certain um, temporal scale, yeah. I think it's a point of no return. Mm-hmm. Um, there are certainly instances where humans in the past um, tried to do things a little bit differently. Uh, there are I- examples of, of hunter-gatherers who um, m- might have had social organizations that were more complex than what we generally associate with hunting and gathering peoples. Yeah. For example, in the southern Mississippi uh, region, there's the site of uh, Poverty Point, which has got some quite elaborate mound constructions with it. And there were even mound constructions earlier than mm-hmm. Poverty Point, going back about 5,000 years ago. And these are s- certainly ref- reflecting um, some, some kind of social, political organization that we don't generally associate with nomadic hunting and gathering peoples, yeah. which these, those people were. It lasted for a while, and then it disappeared. And eventually mound building would come back uh, a couple thousand, you know, a thousand or so years later. Yeah. Um, a- and it would indeed reflect some a social and political organization that, that was quite different. And they were agriculturalists by that, by that time. There are instances where our ancestors sort of attempted different things, did things in a different way, and, and then they stopped that. Um, uh, agriculture begins as a, a very low-level activity. It's, a, mm-hmm. it's merely a um, one contribution to what is largely a hunting and gathering diet. Yeah. It takes a long time for agriculture to sort of get, get, get going and become the dominant uh, element of people's 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 diet, so things the the transitions can happen slowly in yeah. human terms, yeah. and they can have some reversals. Mm-hmm. But when you step back and look at all of human prehistory, sort of at at as sort of at one one gaze, yeah, you can certainly see they start to acquire a bit of a directionality. There 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 is a a directionality to yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it depends on what your temporal scale is, yeah. but there is, a, there is a directionality to it. And, and it reaches a point where you can't go back. We, like with, we can't go back to being hunter-gatherers. One of the, one of the, the themes that I, I learned about as an undergrad in classes on the origin of civilizations, complex urban agricultural societies, I should say, is there actually appears to have been a decline in health in a variety of ways 
mm-hmm. as people became agriculturalists, that nutrition got worse, that uh, dentition started to look uh, less and less healthy, right. that this isn't something that if you, if you were able to walk up to a hunter-gatherer, let's say 15,000 years ago in the Fertile Crescent and say, here, can I, like, you try to pitch it to them, like sell them on the idea yeah. of, yeah. of living in a village and having the diet of somebody like 10,000 years later, that that might not actually have looked very, looked very appealing to them. Um, if, if you could try and tell them, here's all the bad things that are going to happen, <laughs> happen to you. Um, but we, we, th- this happens to us all the time with, mm-hmm. with people warning us about, here's all the bad things that are going to happen if, if, if you let your kids have a smartphone. Here, here's the bad th- you know they have, they, have inter- they have access to the Internet. That's yeah. great. They also have access to all kinds of things. You really don't want them looking. They also at. Have, have access to the internet. <laughs> that, yes, yes, that's the good news. It's also the bad, the bad news. Yeah, um, and yet we still do it. Um, I, I remember once in Madagascar talking with a, a Mikaya man who did slash and burn uh, maize horticulture in the in the forest. He was complaining to me about the lack of animals to hunt in the forest. And the major animal that they could hunt in the forest are lemurs. Mm -hmm. Lemurs need the forest as their habitat. Right. So I pointed out to him, well, as you're cutting down the forest to do slash and burn swidden horticulture, you're destroying the forest. That's why there's no lemurs here. So why do you cut down the forest? He patted his, his stomach and said, because I'm hungry. And he knew exactly what he was doing. Yeah, he yeah. knew why the, there were no more lemurs <laughs> to hunt, but yeah. he also knew he and his family had to eat that day, and this is the way to do it. Is that does that kind of go to Garrett Hardin's tragedy of the commons? This idea that the gain from exploiting a common resource can accrue to an individual, while the costs are kind of borne collectively. Uh, and 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 we don't see the costs until they're right. They're slow, often kind of invisible. They're they're slow yeah. and invisible, and then suddenly we've got global global warming, right? Which didn't really take off until the 1950s, but the the thing that put it into really put it into motion, fossil fuels, these go back really to the early 19th century. So so, I, and I'm not sure if you told people in the early 19th century. Hey, if you guys <laughs> yeah, keep doing yeah. this... If you could give them the full, the full picture. The full picture, yeah. I think they'd still say, what's the option? Right. It's not solar. It's not wind. It's, you know, it's, it, it's, it wasn't even hydraulic. It, yeah. It's really coal. <laughs> that's, that's the option. And they, and they could also take the position that so many people today take, which is, hey... That's someone else's problem. Right. That's for a future generation to deal it's with. for a future generation. Right. We figured out how to deal with problems. Yeah. Now they'll figure out how to deal with problems. Yeah. It'd be nice if we didn't bequeath them such problems, but, but I'm afraid that's the way that people think. Was it, was it challenging to, uh, trying to identify the moments in the grand scale of human history that to you looked like the biggest transitions? You know, from the first tool makers to the explosion in art and culture, uh, to the first farmers and the first cities, to the state. Were, were any of those particularly sticky or kind of hard to settle on or hard to define? Uh, no. In a word, no. Yeah. And the reason is I approached it as an archaeologist. Yeah. And when an archaeologist excavates a site, um, or looks at the archaeology of a region, mm-hmm. they can they can see all this material remains, right? Yeah. Stone tools, arrowheads, and um, grinding stones, and pottery, and and different kinds of architecture, and a, 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 as you build up enough of a record and enough of knowledge of the archaeology of a site or of a region, yeah. yeah, you start to see, wow, you know, it's. Everything I'm excavating is just um, projectile points and scrapers and bifaces. Up until 
about this age. And suddenly. And then suddenly I get a different kind of material culture yeah. in, in place. Yeah. And that kind of goes along for a while. And then there's some other change or uh, addition to the material record. Th- this is the advantage of archaeology where we can kind of step back yeah. and see yeah. things in these, these broad time, time scale. So when I simply stepped back and looked at um, all of human history, six million years of it, and then asked, wh- where are there these really dramatic changes in the material record? It became pretty obvious for me yeah. where w- what what points those 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 were, and those were the first four beginnings. And then the fifth beginning is just a recognition that... Yeah, what is the fifth beginning? The, the, what's the, happening now? The, the fifth beginning? I don't know exactly what's happening <laughs> now. And a, part of the point of the book was that we now have the knowledge of human past that we should be able to create the, the future that we, we want. I'm not into predictions because yeah. predictions usually don't come, come true. Yeah. And, and the best way to predict the future is to create it. So, and why did I think we're in a fifth beginning now? Because it's, again, looking at the material record, at the material footprint mm-hmm. of humanity. And this is not a beginning that's lasted for like the last 20 years. This is it, still it, on a broader time scale than an individual It's in an individual It's more life, like right? the last 500 years. Mm-hmm. It's, it's really since Europe began moving out Mm-hmm. around the world, exporting their technology mm-hmm. to the rest of the world, but also exporting their form of state government yeah. as well yeah. as agriculture. And they brought things back from other parts yeah. of the world. Uh, the Columbian well. exchange takes place. Yep. Global trade networks become more developed than ever before. Yep. Uh, technology kind of enters a new exponential moment of uh, increasingly fast development. Um, so yeah. it's sort of a suite of things then, right? Yeah. Yeah. And it, and it, from an archaeological point of view, I can simply look at like Denver and the front front, front range from Colorado Springs up, up to Fort, Fort Collins. 200 years ago, there was – it was just the indigenous folks living there and they were living as – Primarily as hunter hunter gatherers, yeah, a little bit of maize agriculture comes in down yeah. down to the south, um, but they're they're mostly hunter and gatherers. They're living at very low population densities. Yeah, they're nomadic, and now only two hundred years later, it, that's that's just the blink of an eye to an uh, to an archaeologist. Two hundred years later, we've got uh, over a million people living along the front range, and they're living in. Huge buildings and there's yeah, just like an highways. unbroken belt of construction and concrete from Fort Collins down to Colorado Springs. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's the sort of thing that a future archaeologist would look at this and go, "Well, we've got all this yeah. evidence of hunting and gathering people, and now we've and got explosion. Now we've got skyscrapers. Yeah. What yeah. the heck just happened? That's a that's a an enormous transition. Yeah, and it happened." Everywhere in the world, over the last five hundred years, are you are you an optimist or a pessimist? Are those are those? Would you pick a side there? Do you like either side? <laughs> I, 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 I'd I'd say, well, personally, I, I'm I'm quite a, a pessimist. Hmm. It's it's the reason that I I never gamble because I, I figure I'm always going to lose. Yeah. So I don't I don't gamble. Um. But in the, in the book, I intentionally take a, a more optimistic perspective. And I take an optimistic perspective because the humanity has been presented with challenges in the past, and we found ways to solve them. Um, that's one reason. The, the other reason is that before I wrote Fifth Beginning, I certainly read many other books Many of them dealing with global, global uh, climate climate change, mm-hmm. which they rightfully um, take a very present a very terrifying uh, picture, 
and that's, like I said, that's the correct picture. But most of them are very pessimistic. They don't see humanity doing anything about it. Right. And they may be right. They may be right. But when I get done reading those, that kind of book, I close the cover and I go, well, might as well go party down. Because <laughs> yeah, nothing to do about it. We're, we're going to Ellen Ann Basket and there's yeah. nothing we can do about it. Yeah. Although I'd like to see someone do something about it. We apparently don't have the willpower to do something about it. Mm-hmm. So why bother trying? Yeah. I didn't want to write a book that left people with a sense of we're doomed. Yeah, you didn't want to be fatalistic. I, I didn't want to be because if you, if you take that attitude, that is what will happen. Yeah. You won't, you'll say there's nothing we can do about it. Yeah. And so people will do nothing. And in fact, the, the, if the problem's going to be solved, it's going to be solved by us doing something constructive. That's the only solution. And with every other big transition that's taken place um, in human history, it seems to me like on balance, in each case, there's been bad things that came with the transition, and there's been good things that come with the transition, and there's plenty of ammunition for either the optimist or the pessimist to, to describe those transitions how they want to. If you, if you want to look at the evils of the emergence of the state, Mm-hmm. That's an easy. That's really easy. There's there's plenty of terrible things to point to. Yeah. But if you want to point, if you want to think about the the positives of, of states and 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 the greater complexity of that stage of human history, it's not too hard to find examples either that um, you can kind of get whatever you come in looking for. Well, h- human life will always be a work in progress. Yeah. There, we're not gonna sort of reach a point where we can just kind of wipe the dust off our hands and say, well, we're done. We've, yeah. we've reached there. That won't ever happen, in part because there are always unintended and unforeseen consequences of the things that, that we do. Um, the, the, the rise of the autocracies in the world today mm-hmm. uh, is – is partly a product of the rise of sort of liberal democracies around the world yeah. because they represented such a threat to the the power and the position of uh, autocracies yeah. that they have had to ramp up their their position yeah. um, that yeah. much more strongly. That that's not. That's not what anyone anticipated in the 90s, that we thought at the end of the Cold War, liberal democracies had won, and that the idea of democracy and free trade would spread, would just spread all over the world because it's the good one, right? It's the good, it's, it does the yeah. most good for the, for the most number of, of, of people. And I do believe that, but it really gave rise to very powerful autocracies which realized that they were going to disappear if they did not fight extremely hard. Yeah. So we see today R- Russia willing to enter into what could become World War III in order to maintain their position of power. And World War III could, <laughs> it could destroy everything. Yeah, not to be too controversial, but World War III would be bad. <laughs> would I don't think we. It's a controversy, controversial to say World War Three would be. We don't want that. <laughs> terrible, terrible, and yet they're willing. They're willing to um, uh, take that that risk. Yeah. And and they can partly take the risk because they know that the liberal democracies are. N- almost certainly not going to be the first ones to use nuclear weapons. Yeah. I, yeah. I don't see that happening. Seeing, seeing the way that we can get, get at some really uh, profound and you know, often very like prescient contemporary issues with this sort of bigger way of looking at history, with kind of a big history perspective, 
I thought that that would be a good starting point before then asking you about one of the projects that you've been working on for quite a few years now that's sort of finally starting to culminate um, mm. that I thought without any context like this, people might not realize uh, how interesting it is, um, which is your uh, radiocarbon database. Right. Um, so n now that people have a little context for the value of looking at the forest rather than the trees and the uh, value yeah. of big history. Could you yeah. talk for a, a, a few minutes about yeah. what the radiocarbon that's database a, is and what it's a, for? That's a, that's, a, that's a good setup, Sebastian. <laughs> good setup. Um, the, the radiocarbon database is a project that we started back in 2014, and it ran through about last, last year. Um, we are now working with the database, but we're, we're done sort of collecting data. Yeah. There'll, there'll be more dates generated, of course, in the future, but that will have to be someone else's job. Yeah. Um, and I, I started doing this because of my, uh, my, my perspective that archaeology's strength is looking at big spatial temporal patterns. Yeah. But much archaeological data is simply not, it hasn't been compiled into that kind of big data format so that somebody could look at these big, big patterns across space and time. And so what it is is it's a collection of, it's national, right? It's for the U.S.? It's, it's for the continental U U.S. For the continental U.S. So, yeah. so it's a compilation of, well, I'm sure not, Every but nearly every radiocarbon date recorded. Well, I'd in say the United States. I'd say as many as we could possibly find in yeah. the in the time we had to work on the the project. Um, there's almost certainly dates that we've not yeah. that that we didn't find yeah um, or that haven't been published yet, so they're mm -hmm. not findable yeah. Um, but we compiled a little over a uh, hundred thousand. Dates. Some of those are what we call paleontological dates. They're dates on animal bones or out of pollen cores that are not dating. They they weren't generated by people. Yeah. Um, and some others are geologic dates. These are out of just geologic contexts. Yeah, looking at relative strata and oh, ones that have been the, dated and things the, like that. Charcoal or wood. Yeah. That's that came from a forest fire mm -hmm. and got incorporated into geologic deposits. Yeah. But um, the lion's share, probably about 87,000 of those uh, dates Jeez. are from archaeological sites. What we can do with those now is look at uh, patterns over space and time using the radiocarbon dates as a as a proxy, I'll say it's an imperfect proxy, but as a proxy for uh, the size of the human po population. Right, so it's a representation of the human footprint uh, exactly. on, in the continental U.S. Exactly. I, I mean, the very simplistic way to put it is when you have a few radiocarbon dates, you have a few people, and when you've got a lot of radiocarbon yeah. dates, you've got a lot of, of people. A lot of people leave a lot of stuff. A few people leave few stuff. Yes, Yeah. yes. It's not perfect, um, but we've been trying to work out the ways to deal with the imperfections in the in the in the record. And I, and I think it's a as a relative measure, it's it's the best that we've got at the at the moment to look at data on the scale of the continent. How many hours went into that? That must must have been a. I mean, hours. It seems uh, like such a a mammoth. Project. How many people were, were working on it? Well, I I had a postdoc mm -hmm. uh, working with me, and then I employed um, students to help go through the literature and pull out the radiocarbon dates. Um, I don't know exactly how many people I had. I employed over the. It was about seven years that the project ran. Yeah. Um, it's supposed to run for six, but COVID extended. Uh, it for a while, um, but th yeah, there were quite a few students, and there were actually a number of people around the country who had kind of the same idea. 
um, and they were collecting radiocarbon dates for their state or their uh, region Mm -hmm. or their research question. And so there uh, were kind of pieces forming that you had the chance to fuse together. Right. And we just asked them, can we take your data and add this into the database? And every single one said, yeah, Yeah. this would be a great idea. Yeah. Um, That's why the paper we we published on this has about two dozen authors on it because those are all the people who had been yeah. collecting these dates over the, over the years. And I'm kind of curious if you have any um, initial questions or project ideas in mind of the sorts of things that you want to ask this database now that it exists. One, one of the things we've done with the database already is to take um, kind of the, the 24,000 best dates out of the data database and use them to construct um, something called a summed probability dis- distribution. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's just a way of taking radiocarbon dates, which radiocarbon dates are not, they, they don't date to a year, they date to a, a range, range of years. Yeah. And w- once we calibrate them, they, 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 they form a probability distribution that's best described as funky rather than, say, a nice normal dis- distribution, huh, okay. which anyone who knows statistics knows yeah. what a normal distribution yeah. looks like. A radiocarbon distribution, once it's been calibrated to account for changes in the amount of carbon, r- radioactive carbon in the atmosphere over the years, produces a very weird probability distribution. It can be bimodal it could be trimodal it, yeah it can have little peaks and valleys to it yeah it's not a nice well-behaved normal distribution yeah um so, but so you have to deal with that fact yeah um and i don't want to get into all the technical stuff of it but we can take these twenty-four thousand radiocarbon dates calibrate them and then basically sum them all together to look at the distribution of radiocarbon probability in the United States over the last 14,000 years. And that creates um, something that's completely expectable. We have very little probability back 14,000 years ago. So yeah, the very, first people trickling in. First people trickling in. Very low population, yeah. not spread everywhere in the country, um, so they leave a very ephemeral trace behind. So not very many radiocarbon dates, not much radiocarbon probability, and then it sort of steadily grows through time and almost at a at an at an exponential rate yeah. until about AD eleven fifty. And why is that? I you hit a plateau at that point, or flattening out? We hit a peak. And then it dip. And then it declines. Hmm. Okay. Now, we don't know exactly what that's all about, but it declines until about A.D. 1500. It seems to hit a plateau, and then it declines again. Now, the decline after A.D. 1500— That would be, I assume, the introduction of— that's, diseases from the old world, those sorts of things. That's um, that's the, the European diseases. Violence and conquest and all the— yeah. Conquest, genocide, yeah. all the horrible stuff. Yeah. Um, but we don't know what the decline at around AD 1150 is. And that's a, that's a pattern that an earlier study working with a smaller, lower-quality database found the same answer. That's really interesting. Now, what what we can now do and what we've just started working on in the last couple of weeks is looking at the um, how that decline plays out spatially across the continental right. does U.S. It start, where does it start? Where does, does it, it spread to? Right. Where does it start? Where does it spread to? Is it appearing yeah. at different? Because the the continental picture is an average of the lower 48 states. Right. And so when we start looking at regions, it's not all happening at the same the same time. Some places don't decline at all until uh, Europeans hmm. appear on the scene. Some places, like Wyoming, the decline actually happens earlier than AD 1150. And in other places, 
It's huh. more like AD 1250 or 1350. And we don't fully know what to make of these, these, uh, we, these patterns. We don't yet. know what to make of it yet. Yeah. And we can, we can start to see movements of people because there's a decline in one place and hmm. then there's a... And meanwhile, there's more people in another place. There's, there's more population rate. pressure and suddenly they can move in. Yes. And wow. we know this from other studies that this is already happening. We can yeah. see it in particular places. So we know that around AD 1150, the, what's known as the American Bottom, it's kind of the central Mississippi Valley around the city of St. Louis, mm -hmm. that's abandoned. And a lot of those people move up the Ohio River into uh, Ohio. And some of those people probably move west out onto uh, the, great, the Great Plains. So we've got these little pieces that we already kind of knew about um, we know that when Europeans arrived in the, in the Western Hemisphere, that big chunks of the interior of the Eastern U.S., there's nobody there hmm. or very, very few people yeah. there. Yeah. Um, that's known as the empty quarter. We can see it happening along the Savannah River. The Savannah River is abandoned and people move down to the mouth of the Savannah River. So we can, we've got these little pieces that we already kind of knew about, but we're not going to be able to look now at it. Now get knit together into a bigger it's, tapestry of what's it, going on. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And wow. we haven't figured that out yet. It's, um, it's not a simple problem. It, it's, it's mathematically, it's, a, it's kind of a difficult problem. You have to decide what your spatial unit is going to be. Yeah, yeah. And we have to be careful because the nature of the, of the problem is such that the, the, the construction of the radiocarbon curves, there, there can be some artificial peaks and valleys in there. That's a function of the mathematics of hmm, okay. correcting the radiocarbon dates yeah. for changes in the amount of carbon for atmospheric carbon 14 over over time it gets it can get pretty pretty technical but my my point is to say it's it's this is not a it is not a simple problem to work yeah. out but i've got some people who are far smarter than me helping helping with it so i th we will we'll, we will get we'll, we'll reach some conclusions and this will be a resource that, like, if they were a, an enterprising undergraduate thinking about grad school or a graduate student in anthropology um, looking for a thesis topic, um, this is a database that's available that people can start to the, make use of? The, the database is publicly available Yeah. Um, in, a, in a few different ways. The, the primary way is through the uh, Canadian Archaeological Radiocarbon data, Database. When we started this project, we, we thought we were going to create our own data, database. Uh -huh. And then I discovered that the, the, the Canadians had actually started a database actually back in the 19, late 1980s. And um, it had become somewhat moribund over the years because hmm. the, the person who was the driving force uh, had passed away. And no one stepped in to fill the shoes? or No one stepped in to fill the shoes until just about the time that we started our project. Yeah. And the Canadians informed me that they were going to um, revamp the database, add a Google Earth interface and all these bells and whistles to it. And so I said, I'm not going to reinvent the wheel. Yeah. I'll just yeah. populate the, the, the data, database. So that's what, that's what we did. And... That's one of the places where it's where the database is available. If you could see, um, let's say, uh, two or three new projects get started related to this kind of uh, these these big trends that you can look at through the radiocarbon database, what are some things you what are some questions you have that you wish somebody would start to tackle? The um, one one of the big questions that archaeology has always faced and that 
it has debated back and forth over the years is what, what is the role of population, population size, population density, and population pressure mm-hmm. on the, the, the things that archaeologists see changing, which are things like sub- subsistence, mm-hmm. the transition from hunting and gathering to agriculture, or changes in the kinds of technology mm-hmm. that people are using, yeah. or changes in the... Uh, the 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 emphasis that people place on different sources of food, for example, marine uh, re- resources, or um, h- how does population relate to changes in the social and political organization that humans have devised? Yeah, h- how does population relate to those? It almost certainly has to play some role. But we haven't really been able to understand that role. Right, to ask it on the kind of scale that you would need. Well, to to ask it on a scale, but to also ask it with a measure of population that can be used more or less everywhere. Mm -hmm. Because we have radiocarbon dates for every place. It's the primary method of dating archaeological sites of the last, really the last 50,000 years years. Yeah. So yeah. we can now use dates as a as a course um, uh, proxy for human population size. And we can use it in the western US, the eastern US. If we had the databases, we could do it for for Mexico. Yeah. Um, yeah. for any place in the world of the last fifty thousand years, because that's the limit of of radiocarbon uh, dating. So there are a number of different kinds of problems relating population to subsistence to technology yeah. to social political organization so it's like the center spoke in a wheel that we can connect to out to different yeah, to these these all of these, these different, different patterns different that relate to human yeah human behavior across time well i i hope so because yeah. we put an awful <laughs> lot of effort into it i i'd hate to see it do do nothing for the for the field well on that note, uh, thanks for talking with me, Bob. I really oh, appreciate it. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. And thank you for listening to this episode of The Tell. Until next time. Hey, everybody. If you enjoyed the podcast and you want to help me talk to more people in more places, please consider donating. You can do so on my Patreon as a recurring donor as well as on my website if you'd rather do a one-time donation. The links are patreon.com slash Sebastian Weatherby and www.sebastianweatherby.com. Show notes are also available on my website, where you can find citations and comments and other relevant information about the things we talked about today. Thanks again for listening.